Uh, welcome to the Accessibility Challenge session, and I'm the one of the co-chairs of this session. My name is Yuran Oh, and Xiaomei wished to be here, but she couldn't make it. It's like 4 a.m. in the morning, but she really wanted to hope to be here. Okay, so we have four presenters today, and afterwards we're gonna have a demo session at the end. Uh, it's called Demo Madness, and I did share a link to everyone through Zoom. And after uh, watching all this, listening to all these presentations, please vote for your favorite. And this link will be alive until the, set, the conference is, is over. So we'll be advertising the link throughout the conference. So please vote for your favorite um, and do encourage all the presenters. So the first um, presenter here today is Adam and the title of this talk will be creating an open source customizable accessibility checker for content author. So Adam, please, when you're, whenever you're ready, please go ahead and start your talk. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm calling in from Toronto, Canada. The local time is 7.30 a.m. here. So I, I only woke up a few minutes ago. <laughs> and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I will be presenting uh, an open source accessibility checker that has been in the works for the last um, last two or three years. Um, I only released it as open source in 2020. And um, since then, it has gone over a couple uh, large revisions. Um, so I'm going to just quickly present a few slides just to give you the overview. So the challenge. Um, recently, the WebAIM 1 million report recently released their 2022 report of the top 1 million inaccessible home or the top 1 million home pages. And um, this is just a table that I just uh, grabbed from the report. It's the the, ta the table is the home pages with the most common WCAG2 failures. And um, first, I'll just go over the most common failures that they found. So um, low contrast text being the highest, and then, then following that, missing alternative text for images, empty links, missing form input labels, empty buttons, and missing document language. And um, the four remaining columns are the percentage of those issues on the home pages in the last four years. And um, uh, long story short, from 2022 to 2019, it hasn't been much of a change. Um, uh, for example, missing alternative text for images in 2022 is 55.4% and percentage of homepages in 2019 was 68%. Um, and then uh, 90, in total, or just a summary, 96.5% of all errors detected fall into these six categories. The most common common errors uh, have been the same for the last four years. So um, I guess you can see where I'm going with uh, in terms of the challenge. Um, but uh, one of the main reasons why I created this was um, when I, with at, at Ryerson, we have our internal content management system. So just to give you a high level overview, we use Adobe Experience Manager, and it is not like WordPress where it, you can easily plug, plug and play different accessibility checkers. Um, it's it's an enterprise grade system. We have over 700 content authors, and these are content authors of various technical backgrounds. Um, predominantly of those 700, they are mostly non-technical. Um, this includes admin assistants, students even, um, people who work in uh, marketing and communication roles. So as you can imagine, with 700 content authors and uh, Ryerson University, it's a fairly large university. It's over 5,000 staff, I believe. So when you think about training, um, employee turnover and um, 700 people, it, it's quite, it, it's a lot. And um, on top of that, we have over 50,000 pages. So um, as you can imagine, 50,000 pages, if you've ever used any cloud-based software, the cost of using cloud-based tools can get very expensive. Um, most of us may know that um, a lot of these, a lot of the pricing based on these cloud, cloud-based tools are by the number of pages you have. Um, just to give you a, a ballpark uh, estimate, 15,000 pages equates to almost around $20,000 Canadian. Um, I think that's around 15,000 US-ish. I'm not quite sure. Um, 
but it's, as you can imagine, uh, that amount every year gets quite pricey. So, so some of my challenges included um, training 700 staff, working on a limited budget, and then working on a, on a, with a cloud-based tool that has a limited number of pages to crawl. So my solution, um, or sorry, just not, I won't get to my solution just yet, but just to give you paint a better picture of internally of our content management systems, our content authors can't do a can't do a lot. They can't add any uh, custom colors. They can't change the colors. So we have a limited color palette. So technically, if you go to any Ryerson.ca page, there shouldn't be any contrast issues. Um, and they can't add their own custom inline CSS. They can't add their own custom inline JavaScript. Um, on the screen here, I have two screenshots of of a WYSIWYG editor. Oh, this is the editing the HTML uh, HTML editor and it's blocking any inline scripts and uh, inline CSS. And on top of that, we also have a limited component library. So these are a uh, set, um, set amount of components. Um, it's not like WordPress where you can drag and drop or install any plugin, um, limited component library. As you can imagine from this slide, this makes my job as an IT accessibility specialist a lot easier. Um, and in addition to that, our content authors only have access to editing the main local, the main content area and the local footer. So I have a screenshot of an example website with a thick red border around the main content area. So um, that's a high level summary of what things are like within our content management system at Ryerson. Long story short, um, when it comes to managing or enforcing web accessibility at our institution, we only have to worry about content related issues. This means um, images having alt text, uh, descriptive links, um, uh, proper heading structure. Pretty much most of the things identified in that web aim 1 million report. So um, next is we need to find the right tool. So just a disclaimer, I'm gonna show a bunch of tools um, in the upcoming three slides. They are all fantastic tools. I use them all at various points in time. Um, my intention is not to uh, put them, uh, my, my, my intention is not to make, sorry, I hear some, hear some background noise. Um, I'm not, my point is not to discredit these tools. These are all fantastic tools. So I'm just gonna uh, just kind of give you an insight into the criteria of choosing the right ones. So this is a screenshot of Site Improve. And um, right now it says links. The issue is it says links are not clearly identifiable. It says color alone is not enough to distinguish a link from the surrounding text. Um, if you look in the screenshot, you can see that the hyperlinks do in fact have uh, uh, underline. So they do, uh, so they are identifiable and it's not just using color alone. So this is an example of a false positive that you might uh, typically get with any cloud-based tool, not specific to this tool. And here's another one. It's a screenshot of our skip to main content button or skip to main content link in the top of the page. Um, and the warning here is, is it possible to skip straight to the main content area? The first item reached by keyboard should be a link to the main content. Um, when it comes to this specific issue, this is not really relevant to a content author as this isn't something that they should be in. Uh, this isn't really relevant to their job as a content editor because they're not doing um, large code fixes to our templates. So this is something that should be managed by a developer. Next, I have a uh, wave. So this is getting a little bit closer to what I desire in a typical tool. It's more visually oriented. Uh, although it's more content author friendly, it's just a little bit too comprehensive. You can see that it shows the different ARIA roles and it's a lot, it's still very, although visual, it is still more developer orientated. Next, I have the totally bookmarklet. So um, uh, it's, this is a fantastic tool for developers um, who are still learning accessibility, in my opinion, because it just, uh, it's 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 visually oriented, so it kind of helps um, convey uh, different the, these five or six main um, uh, mo uh, modules here. So headings, contrast, link text, labels. Again, most of the common things in the Web one, mil one million report. Although the one thing that it was missing is that it uh, it doesn't really help with 
um, quality accessibility. So making sure that images have alt text. So it will, nothing will, there will be no annotations if you do provide alt text. Um, so there's no way to review your work. So um, my solution was to, so it's almost perfect. Um, so my solution was to create Sally. So Sally is a quality assurance, uh, I call it the quality assurance, um, sorry, let me just open it up here. So I call it the Accessibility Quality Assurance Assistant. And uh, what makes it special is that it fo only strictly focuses on content related accessibility issues. So um, there are so many tools available for developers and um, there isn't uh, so many tools just that, that just focuses on content related accessibility. So thinking back to my challenges at Ryerson, I only wanted uh, content authors to focus on those four or five main high level accessibility areas. So the beauty about, or about Sally is that it focuses on um, just those high level things. Um, it's available, first let me talk about it from a platform or from a architectural perspective. So it's a customizable framework agnostic JavaScript plugin. There's about over 50 checks that encourage quality accessibility. And uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate what I mean by quality accessibility in a moment. It's automatic. So as you can see on page load, it's highlighted the number of errors on the page just through like a little iOS style notification badge. Um, it's customizable. So there's JSON, uh, JSON like props to fine tune and customize the experience. And it's scalable. So um, where uh, cloud-based solutions uh, stop you or limit you at 15,000 pages. Um, you can easily insert Sally on every page because it's just uh, it's just a JavaScript plugin. And um, to be clear, it is not a web accessibility overlay. There is no AI involved. It is strictly an accessibility checker. And and my also my other disclaimer: it is not a comprehensive code analysis tool. So this isn't meant to replace any of the large automated tools um, out there. Um, so what I mean by uh, uh, quality assurance is that, let me just quickly scroll down. Here I have four images. It has a, uh, Sally has a huge emphasis on quality. So for example, most tools um, don't really show you the alt text that you've input on your, on your images. So here I have a picture of a dog wearing a, like a bear hat and the alt text was bear. And I have this other dog here and the alt text was doggy.jpg. So um, it's not, you're not supposed to add the file extension in your alt text. And then I have images that hyperlink here. So this link says, learn more about dogs and there's a good annotation. So it also, Sally also shows successes. It says images marked as decorative, although the link is using the surrounding text as a descriptive label. And then the next one says, uh, the next annotation, it says image link contains alt text, although please ensure alt text describes the destination page. Consider using the title of the page it links to as the alt text. So this is what I mean by a focus on quality accessibility. It's meant for content authors to review their work. In terms of installation or in terms of the design and architecture, I first, um, I decided to go with the bookmarklet approach. So um, Sally, my tool is actually inspired or adapted from Totally. So Totally is the totally by Khan Academy. So I showed you in a previous slide. Um, obviously, it looks very different, but kind of the inspiration came from totally. Um, so very simply, um, you can actually install Sally right now within your own bookmarks bar. Here's the bookmarklet. I'm going to drag and drop it um, just to go show you. So I'm going to just use it on the web for all conference page. So uh, my intention is not to uh, point out the flaws in uh, this page. Um, but just to give you an example, um, my first error here, it says there's an empty heading found. So to fix, delete this line or change its format from heading two to normal. Um, some of these warnings, it, it's asking, is this a heading? So a line of bold text might look like a heading, but someone using a screen reader cannot tell that it's important or jump to its content. And I can see there's a few bolded lines as text. So. Um, Next, let's just review some of the images. So again, uh, we're reviewing the we're reviewing the quality 
of our accessibility on this page. So here it says image link contains alt text. And does the alt text describe where the link takes you? So here I have alt text to IPM, Google. I'm hovering over the Intuit logo, although it says the alt text is meta. So it looks like the person who updated this page um, incorrectly uh, has a couple alt text mistakes. Um, next, I'm going to go to the supporters tab here, where the OpenConf logo. Um, this one correctly says OpenConf. Then when I go to the uh, UD UD Talk, the alt text still says OpenConf. And when I go to Able Docs, it still says OpenConf. So as you can see here, um, this isn't an accessibility error that's going to be flagged by any checker because these images do have alt text. Although um, only Sally can help you um, review your alt text to make sure that you're properly putting the right alt text for images. Um, the second thing I want to show, if I still have time, is that um, I recently, this past uh, two or three weeks, released a um, WordPress plugin. And um, I feel like the WordPress plugin really gives you an overview of how you can customize Sally. Um, I'm on the advanced settings page for my tool here. And um, Sally is meant to ultimately be um, customized um, strategically. So for example, if your content owners can, if your content editors can only uh, edit content within the main content area, I'm gonna pass in the main, um, main query selector. So that's the main content area. So that's my target area to check. So now Sally will only scan the main content area. And then secondly, in the case of Ryerson, we don't have any contrast issues because of our limited color palette. So I'm gonna completely turn off that contrast module. And our content authors can't, uh, they don't have to worry about forms either. So I'm gonna turn that off as well. Um, for now, I'm just gonna do that. And then since this is a WordPress site, by default, I'm going to hide the comments section. And I know just by looking at the selector for that is uh, comments. So it's gonna completely ignore the comments section. I'm gonna save my page. I'm gonna refresh. I'm gonna go to just a sample page with issues. Now, when I enable Sally, first I'm gonna show the show settings. As you can see, the contrast module and the forms module has been completely has completely been turned off and also hidden. Um, our content authors don't have to worry about it, so no need to um, inundate them with various warnings and errors. Otherwise, um, again, it's a visually orientated tool. It annotates the page. So for example, here I have a nondescript learn more link. And again, it's, its focus is, to meant, is meant for content related issues, but it's also very scalable and flexible, and it's great for accessibility strategists because of its ability to uh, enable or turn off specific checks and also to uh, you know, turn off specific modules. The last thing I will share if I have a moment is um, the developer docs because I, as a scalable tool, um, the next really cool thing is the custom checks. The custom checks, um, it, I, Sally almost works as an API, not in a traditional sense with a server, but um, there's a lot of utilities to help um, scale Sally. So for example, with just a few lines of code, you can create your own um, your own errors or rule sets. So here I have a form component with a form in it. And um, when I enable Sally, it flags this as an error. It says, do not nest forms within the accordion component. If the form contains validation issues, a person may not see the form feedback since the accordion panel goes back to its original closed state. So um, that's the example rule set. This is the example 10, 10 or so lines of code that uh, show the logic behind creating that very simple rule set. And this is abstracted into another file. So it's very easy to separate the core library with your custom, with your custom checks. So this uh, custom check taps into some of the existing utilities or functions within the core library. For example, the root area or the target area. In my last um, sour, a moment ago, I showed I passed the value of main for the main content area. So this will only check for that error within the main content area. Sally.error count, um, that's to increase the error or warning count. 
and then I and then this is the Sally dot annotate is the function that actually creates or generates the button and tooltip. So again, uh, set several lines of code for one simple rule set, which is pretty pretty cool or very scalable and um, easy to create and scale. Um, I think that's all my time. Um, I believe there's a Q and A or Q and A component to this. Otherwise, I will drop the link to my demo in the chat. Great. Um, thank you so much for your presentations. It was a great demo, and I believe all the presenters YouTube for that. Please also share. And I actually question. So you have present three uh, burdens, three accessibility tools. Um, could you give me a single? So sorry, my internet is stable. What is the biggest difference between Sally and Totally? So Sally and Totally, um, Sally um, has uh, it's more comprehensive. It has it has more checks and more rule sets, and um, it focuses it, where Sally highlights mostly developer issues. Sally highlights content related issues. So for example, Sally will show you the alt text on existing images. It will show you links that have an accessible name through Aria. Um, there's also a lot more checks. So I work in a university, so there's a lot more things that we're checking for. I'm also making sure that videos have closed captions. So I have a lot of warnings for, for example, iframes that are audio sources or iframes that are video sources. Um, let me quickly go to my overview page. Um, so yeah. the, it has more comprehensive or there's a lot more checks. So I've extended um there's a lot more warnings and i i think um i think it's one of the most or sally has one of the most comprehensive uh checks around like alt text quality for example there's almost um over a dozen um checks for alt text only so for example um sally looks for things like uh, various placeholders um uh, also uh, images that are hyperlinked so it takes the takes that uh, the functional when an image is linked, it's, it becomes a functional image. So um, it takes those things into context. And um, there's other uh, there's a lot more there's a lot more QA or quality assurance type rule sets. For example, um, it that's, will flag in uh, PDFs. Me breaking up, but I think that's oh okay. Sorry. Thank you. Oh sorry. Uh, I think I am the one who's breaking up, but I think that's sufficient for your answer. Uh, I think I'll have to move on to our next presenter, but thank you so much for the presentation. And also I noticed that you have the GitHub page. So please share that yes. as well. And let's move on to our next speaker. By the way, thank you so much. Thank you. Our thank next you, speaker everyone. is going to talk about you um, on the pro uh, a talk name on approach to teach accessibility with game, gamification. Okay, and, and the talk will be given by Muhammad, and he's right here. So please go ahead whenever you're ready. Yes. Hello, everyone. Hello. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay. Uh, I had shared my pre-recorded video. I don't know if it's available because I'm having internet issues here. Um, oh, sorry. Me? I'll be sharing. Yeah. Yes, I'll be sharing his uh, recorded video shortly. I'll share it right now. Thank you. Uh, do you all see, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay. clearly. I will, okay, great. I will play the video right now. Hello, everyone. My name is Muhammad, and I'm going to present our paper titled An Approach to Teach Accessibility with Gamification. 
Over the last years, accessibility has been gaining more recognition. Thus, there is a market demand for professionals skilled in accessibility. However, it is rare to find professionals with broad understanding of accessibility and with accessibility design skills. Therefore, there is a trend towards incorporating accessibility in computer science curricula. Furthermore, many approaches were presented in order to teach accessibility in the academy and reports of success were found. However, mostly in imparting accessibility knowledge and skills, whereas many failed in the department of motivation and engagement. Moreover, gamification is a strong contender when it comes to engaging, motivating and improving the student's performance using game design elements in non-game context. While a few studies dealt with training the professionals in the industry on accessibility through gamification, it has not been much explored to teach accessibility in the academy. Consequently, this work aims to address the identified opportunity and contribute with an accessibility teaching resource aimed at undergraduate computer science or software engineering students to be used as part of a web design course, thus promoting the development of accessible software. Following is the proposed approach, starting with the display of a few videos, introduction to web accessibility and standards, and some web accessibility perspectives videos. The second step is to give a quick overview of the WCAG principles and guidelines version 2.1 and finally a gamified artifact with the simulation of scenarios of WCAG principles situations of failures and techniques will be used to motivate and engage the students. As long as the users give the correct solution they shall gain 10 points per situation accordingly and the quiz shall increase its level as well and right at the end of the quiz the users will obtain a badge according to their earned points the users will face situations and failures or bad accessibility scenarios and they must first identify the principles and guidelines that they are facing and apply the correct solution to it for example text alternatives an image will be displayed which will later disappear. Then the users will have to identify the current WCAG principle and guideline according to the situation that they are facing. Then the users should provide and apply an appropriate solution. Next, keyboard accessible. The users shall face a situation where the mouse device functionality will not be available in a long form and they will have to fill in later submitted using only keyboards. Readable, the users will face many pages in a different language not known by them. They shall have to navigate through the pages and find a section where they will be able to change to a language that they prefer in order to understand the content. And input assistance, the users will face a form with three date inputs each expecting a different date format. Providing the date format instructions, they must fill them accordingly and submit. Next, we'll have a look at our prototype. Access Academy aims to engage and motivate students into learning about accessibility at the Academy through a gamification-based artifact. And it also promotes the development of accessible software. Therefore, a prototype, a web-based prototype, was developed for a Mozambican university, hence it is in Portuguese. Access Academy is a quiz game based on the WCAG version 2.1 document. But before going to the quiz, the Access Academy familiarizes the students on the topic of accessibility with a series of videos created by W3C. And afterwards, it gives an overview of the WCAG 2.1 document. 
once the students have familiarized themselves with the topic of accessibility, they can now move on with the quiz game, which is based on the situations, techniques, or failures found on the WCAG version 2.1 document. Here is the first situation. The page suddenly lost access to the image and the user must identify the principle and guideline to which the situation belongs. If it's correct, he gets 5 points. Afterwards, the Access Academy asks him to provide an alternative text, which he does, and submits, gains another 5 points, now 10, and he sees the result. The next situation, the quiz asks the student to listen carefully to the audio and identify the principal and guideline like the first situation. Uh... The audio is clearly missing some parts and a bit distorted. Hence the student first will choose the guideline and principle and the quiz asks him or her to listen again to the audio and this time Pro to provide a transcription of the audio. So this time the audio is clear and the student can write a transcription and listen every word and write and submit. A new situation with two inputs and borders with the red color. The student will identify as well the principle and guideline, distinguishable, and the quiz will ask the student or user to provide the validation message. Next situation, a form is displayed with five inputs and an instruction below. The mouse cursor is disabled. Fill and submit the form using only keyboard. And now the quiz asks to identify the principal and guideline of the situation the student just went through. Another situation where the student is asked to change the language of the content above to a language he understands. So finally the quiz shows a result page with students acquired points and badge. Amplification has gained a reputation for motivating and engaging participants in many fields and education is one of them. However, gamification has not yet been explored to teach accessibility in the academy. Consequently, the proposed approach takes advantage of the effectiveness of gamification in order to provide a better solution to teach accessibility in the academy. Future work is in progress addressing the development of a prototype through a case study in a classroom and also the evaluation of the approach where the students' progress will be measured through a pre- and post-test questionnaire. Thank you for your attention. Okay, um, I think I was gone for a second, so, but uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It's good that we have the recorded video. 
uh, here's one question. So if not, there's any question from the audience? Okay. Uh, my question is, have you actually tried your system with actual students and do you have more plans to make it more engaging than version, the, the current version? Sorry, couldn't, couldn't hear. You're breaking up. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, have you tested your system with the actual students? That was first question. And do you have more yes. plans to make your system more engaging? Uh, yes, I have tested. Uh, it was two or three weeks ago, and I plan to do it again. And about the plans, uh, I intend to use more game design elements, and uh, I intend to also gather feedbacks from the users to see what, what they want from the quiz itself. And most of them, what they do, what do they use while gaming? What do they like? Great. Like if they are playing FIFA or Call of Duty, what elements do they like more? So I can turn the quiz more engaging and motivating. Okay, I look forward to see your next version. And thank you so much for sharing your uh, link for the others to uh, you. try your system. Um, let's have the next speaker ready. So next talk is, is titled as eight, an automatic image description engine for review imaginary. Okay, do we have the presenter here ready? Uh, I am here. I'm checking to see oh, if Russian is sorry. here as well. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm in. Uh, yeah, I think I skipped the third presenter here. Sorry. Personalized variable instructions very skill. Hello, it, it's okay to leave uh, my colleagues present. Okay, <laughs> okay great. <clears throat> so who's, um, okay, sorry, but let's should we go do this in the order? Or, okay, that's Let's go with the very skill. Sorry, I'm so sorry. No worries, all good. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, you can see my screen. Yeah. Yeah. You're good to go. Yes. <laughs> my name is uh, Bill Saura and I'm from uh, Stefan Chalmari University of Suchava. And today I will present Where Skill, a systematic uh, approach uh, and technical solution for personalized interactions and with uh, wearables such as smartwatches, rings, and glasses. The worldwide market size for wearables has increased in recent years due to the many applications and services that smart wearables enable, such as health, fitness tracking, and integration with connected devices. However, interactions with wearables that are not designed with an accessibility first culture lead to accessibility challenges because of the assumptions that are made about users' abilities. For example, most of uh, the interactions with smartwatches and glasses use touch and gesture input, which may prove challenging for users with upper body motor impairments. Different types of motor impairments determine different motor abilities to use the fingers, wrist, arm, and neck muscles to control wearable devices. In this picture, a smart ring user with spinal cord injury controls the position of the ring with the arm and wrist, not with his fingers. In this context, WearSkill primarily addresses users with upper body motor impairments for whom it enables personalized recommendations for input modalities, touch, motion, and voice, and three categories of wearables, smartwatches, rings, and glasses based on users self-reported motor impairments. WearSkill is a web-based application for personalized input with wearable that acts as a middleware to control connected devices that support Wi-Fi and WebSocket communications. For example, control the smart lightning system with the smartwatch. We adopted a systematic approach consisting of four steps. In a systematic literature review of wearable interactions for users with motor impairments, we found limited research 
available on this topic, an asymmetric interest for hand gestures compared to other input modalities and little involvement of participants with motor impairments in studies about wearable interactions. Based on our findings, we proposed four wise recommendations to increase the accessibility of wearables. WISE framework consists of a diverse designs of wearable devices, new input modalities and techniques, conducting more user studies and extending wearable interactions with and other devices. The second step consisted in understanding user input performance with wearables and preferences for wearables. In a first study with 14 participants with upper body motor impairments, we studied touch screen stroke gestures and neither motion gestures articulated with devices worn on the wrist, finger, and head. We found that users with upper body motor impairments took as much time to produce stroke gestures on wearable touch screens compared to users without uh, impairments, but articulated motion gestures equally fast and with similar acceleration characteristics. In a second study, we enlisted 21 people with upper body motor impairments for their preferences to use wearables to access diverse applications and services of ambient intelligence environments, including control of electronic devices and home appliances. We found high preferences for smartwatches for the control of smart homes and for rings and bracelets for making payments and interacting with public systems. In the third stage, in the context set by our ways wise framework and our empirical findings, we designed WearSkill as a middleware web-based software for personalized input with wearables. WearSkill is a web-based application compatible with WISE that leverages the system and software quality requirements and evaluation model from which it adopts six quality requirements directly relevant to wearables. Modularity, which refers to splitting the software system into discrete units that interact with each other through interfaces. Reusability indicates the degree in which a specific asset can be reused in another configuration of the system. Interoperability is the ability of two or more modules to communicate with each, with each other based on a common standard. Replaceability, which refers to the possibility to replace a software component with another equivalent one. Appropriateness indicates the degree in which the software system meets end user needs, needs in a personalized way. Learnability specifies the capacity of the system to help the user transition from novice to expert mode and uses three technological approaches, web-based design, JavaScript language, and supporting platforms, and HTTP and WebSocket as communication protocols. Based on the direction set by our WISE framework, we formulated four functional requirements for WearSkill must be flexible enough to integrate a variety of wearables, fac facilitates execution of system functions on various output devices, offers out-of-the-box support for logging input data to enable more studies on how users employ wearables and personalized input, and enable personalized and interchangeable input with wearables interpret interpreted as the middleware for a distributed user interface. We developed the user interface on top of Vue.js, a progressive JavaScript framework that enables clear separation between views and view models while backend models run on Node.js. WearScale implements personalized input with wearable devices that have built-in Wi-Fi and support with socket communications. Personalization means flexible associations between wearables and input modalities choose motion input for the smartwatch and voice input for smart glasses. Custom associations between input commands and system functions. For example, directional swipes on the watch for controlling the TV audio volume and personalized recommendations for input modalities based on user self-reported impairments for which we employed 11 categories such as slow movements, spasm, low strength, and so on. 
In a study with 21 people with upper body motor impairments, we found that recommendations provided by WorldSkill with a label spreading classifier matched 85.7% of users' preferences for input modalities and wearables. In its current implementation, where skills support stroke gestures, for example, a symbol drawn on the touch screen of a smartwatch, such as letter M for menu, motion gestures, movements of the head, and voice input captured, for instance, with the microphone embedded in a pair of glasses. WearSkill supports integration of connected appliances, for example, smart lighting for the home that have built-in Wi-Fi and come with a programmable platform supporting WebSocket communications. When these conditions are met, WearSkill acts as a middleware platform and triggers assistant functions on the connected appliance following input on the wearable. To test to test their skill, we developed client web applications for free wearables, Samsung Galaxy Watch 3, Gear Fit 2, that we mounted on a custom 3D printed support to be used as a smart ring, and the Vuzix Blade smart glasses. We also developed two applications for controlling YouTube, YouTube on laptop connected to a large TV set, and the Philips Hugo smart lights using Android app on a smartphone. In this example, a video player running on a smart TV listens for input commands coming from WordSkill. The WordSkill application is shown on the right side of the TV for references uh, purposes. The user controls the audio volume of the TV in which video is displayed by employing stroke gestures on the smartwatch. In another example, gesture input is used to control a smart lightning system. The WearSkill app is shown on the screen in the middle for demonstration purposes only. By performing gestures on the smartwatch, the user controls the intensity and hue of the lightning system. Other wearables and connected appliances can be integrated similarly. We plan to release WearSkill, and WearSkill as an open source software to foster further developments in the interested community towards more accessible wearable interactions for users with diverse motor abilities. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you so much. It's another great talk. It was fun to watch your demos. Uh, I don't see any questions from, this, from Zoom, so let me ask you one. So it seems like uh, a comprehensive app for connecting this interface with the IoT devices at home. And I was wondering if you also consider making the interface itself accessible. Like it seems like someone else is needed to set up the mapping between the devices and the gesture. So is it also accessible with a screen reader or, or like voice input to set this up? Uh, the word skill uh, implements uh, gesture input and voice input too. Um... But I was wondering with, if the app itself, the interface is accessible with voice input or something. It is, it is accessible for voice input. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I understand well the, the questions. Okay. Uh, so WearSkill is, is a web-based application, implements personalized and interchangeable input modalities uh, with various devices. Uh, and uh, um, in, in this moment, the WearSkill applications uh, implements uh, gesture, stroke, motion, uh, head gestures, uh, mm. motion gestures, stroke gestures, and also voice input. Okay, so I can see that you have you are covering most of the variety of gestures, and but the, the app seems that you are using mouse input or keyboard input. So that was what I was asking you, but you're saying that the voice input is also allowed. Uh, yes. Uh, Strong okay. gestures. Okay, okay. Without uh, without uh, yeah. keyboard and mouse input. Okay, thank you so much. So again, <laughs> nice demo. Let's move on to the final, the last speaker, last but not the least. Uh, the talk will be given by Nicole. Is it? Yes. Okay. So last, pay attention to the last speaker for today. 
Uh, Nicole, whenever you're ready, please get started. Sounds good, thank you. Cool, and you guys can see the screen, right? Yeah, yes, cool. and I can hear you fine. Perfect, thank you. Well, hi, my name is Nicole, and we'd like to welcome you to our Accessibility Challenge presentation for AID, an automatic image description engine for review imagery. Roshna and I are creative technologists at Wayfair. Reviews play an important role when a customer shops online. Think about the last time you bought a large furniture item online. You likely looked through the product images, read through the description of the product, including specifications like the size and the weight of the item, and then scroll down to look through reviews. Review imagery is a critical way to showcase products in real life context, helping customers see details about a product that may not be apparent in stage product imagery or in verbiage on the product page. In fact, in a survey conducted by Bazaar Voice in 2021, 66% of customers found that review photos played an important role in helping them make purchasing decisions. 75% preferred user submitted content over stage imagery because they felt it lent, product, it lent products an air of authenticity. And finally, 59% of consumers consider visual information more important than textual information. While browsing through web pages with a screen reader, uh, visually impaired shoppers rely on alternative text, also known as alt text, which is a written description of the content of an image. However, alt text can be sparse because it has to be manually written by a human. In cases where there is higher alt text coverage, these image descriptions tend to lack useful information as they may be created by a generic rule-based system. This means visually impaired shoppers lose out on potentially important information that can influence their purchasing decisions. Examples of generic alt text for review photos can be seen here, ranging from customer image to the name of the product. This can lead to a frustrating experience for those who are visually impaired who may listen to a series of these repetitive alt texts without knowing what's actually contained in the images. To understand what features of alt text visually impaired shoppers wanted to hear in review imagery, we conducted a moderated study with seven, seven visually impaired people over Zoom. Participants were asked about the role of review images in their shopping experience, and they, and they then ranked the importance of including certain features about review photos in alt text. From this investigation, we learned that participants generally had an anything is better than nothing sentiment towards alt text for review photos. Most review imagery lacked alt text and this caused frustration for participants. When ranking review photo features to then be included in the alt text, participants found that the most important content would be the product's color, followed by any unique features of the product, which they described as things like patterns on the material or the shape of the sofa, followed by a description of the room, and finally, a high level overview of the image. We'll now speak more about the system we created from these learnings. So with the findings from the empirical study in mind, we created AID, which stands for Automatic Image Description Engine. AID takes a review photo and its corresponding comments and automatically generates alt text for the review image. At a high level, AID consists of two modules working in parallel. One generates a description of the scene in a review image and the other parses the review comment for product specific features. These outputs are combined using GPT-3 to create alt text that provides context and is human readable. The scene description module provides descriptions of the setting and its contents in the image, both of which were ranked highly in the empirical study. We focused on capturing the context of the scene automatically for each image in a two-step process using computer vision and machine learning. We first detect key objects in the scene with a Vineville object attribute detection model. We obtain the regions and tags for each object detected. These results are fed into an image captioning model that uses a vision language framework called OSCAR to tie together visual features and language elements. This model then outputs human readable sentences. Within the review text processing module, we augment results from scene description with data parsed from the reviewer's comments to obtain more comprehensive alt text, including features that the image processing module might have missed. We employed a series of in-house named entity recognition models to parse semantically relevant keywords from the unstructured review text and then associate these keywords to predefined topics. The implemented models are based off of the bidirectional LSTM CNN neural network architecture. And finally, we then leverage GPT-3 to combine the phrases from scene description and the keywords from review text parsing to generate human readable alt text. I'll now hand it off to Roshna to speak more about the results. Thanks, Nicole. So moving on to results, uh, you can find some examples of eight generated descriptions here. The purple highlights refer to data points obtained from the scene description module. The gray highlights indicate information from the text parsing module. For example, in the image in the top left, you can see that information about key objects 
and the setting is extracted from the scene description module, which is highlighted in purple. In addition, the text parsing module, highlighted in gray, extracts product specific color information from the text, augmenting the scene description output by saying that the color of the couch is blue. In another example, like in the image on the top right, you can see that the scene description module is correctly identified if the image is a zoomed in image of a chair. There are some failure cases that you can see in the bottom row where the object detection algorithm doesn't correctly identify items in the scenes or the named entity recognition models for text parsing didn't find the correct keywords. Next, we'll talk about the technical evaluation that we did to analyze the accuracy of aid. We evaluated the accuracy of the generated by text with human QA. Two cited colleagues each rated 75 OPEX based on their corresponding images. These are the metrics that we asked the raters to evaluate aid against. A, the raters compared aid all text with existing all text on site and selected the better image descriptor. B, we asked the raters to evaluate if the all text described the scene in detail. To quantify this, the raters counted the number of distinct items correctly described in the all text that are present in the image. C, we also had raters count the number of features for each object mentioned in the all text. And finally, D, they were asked to approve or reject the all text. To ensure accurate information is conveyed, we asked raters to approve aid or text only if all items described were present and had the mentioned features in the image. Moving on to some of our results from the technical evaluation. 74% of aid all text was approved, meaning that all objects were present in the image and correctly described. Aid was selected as a better descriptor of an image 85% of the time over the current all text on site. Finally, aid also captures 73% of distinct items present in an image. 16% of aid all text, however, sometimes included an object that wasn't in the image. Now, moving on to our evaluative study. We conducted hour long moderated interviews with 18 visually impaired participants over Zoom to understand if aid generated all text was engaging, understandable, and if it helped participants feel more included and independent in the e-commerce context. Participants were told that they were looking to purchase a new couch and had narrowed it down to two options that we had pre-selected for them. They then browsed <clears throat> each web page like they normally would. A screenshot of the form that they filled out can be seen here. We'll speak a bit more in detail about the results of our evaluative study now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Participants reported that they wanted to continue engaging with the aid generated all text with most saying that they would continue listening to them if given the opportunity to. Some mentioned that they wanted as much information as possible to make an informed decision. Others noted that age-generated descriptions were more useful, more helpful, and more interesting. They contrasted this experience with previous feelings of engagement and frustration on other sites, where they felt that they were being left out of the conversation. Additionally, we found that 83% of participants reported that aid created a more inclusive shopping environment. 15 out of 18 were likely to recommend turning on aid to other visually impaired people. The majority of participants spoke about how their typical online shopping experience included the assistance of sighted people. Some noted how aid made them feel more dependent. Overall, participants felt aid provided a more accessible means of shopping online, a stark contrast from their previous frustrations with all text on most retail sites. <clears throat> Finally, let's talk about takeaways. Review imagery plays an important role for online retail. <clears throat> the lack of all text poses accessibility challenges for visually impaired shoppers. Our empirical studies reveal the most critical facets to describe in review imagery. Product specific color and unique features, as well as a description of the product's context. 
from our technical evaluation, <clears throat> it has been proven to accurately describe distinct items and their features in the view imagery. In our evaluative studies, 83% reported that aid created a more inclusive online shopping environment and that they were very likely to recommend turning on aid to others. Other findings validated that aid increased the feelings of independence and was engaging to users. Thank you for listening to our talk. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, there is a question from the audience. Uh, Adam is asking, how is A different than Azure's computer vision API? So we've customized, customized A to work purely for review imagery. We didn't find any existing, um, existing algorithms for review imagery for user-generated content. Um, and so that's how we're basically, um, we're basically taking in the review text to augment the object detection models to create a more comprehensive all text. Great, um, thank you so much for your answer and uh, response. And also I think this idea, this work is great for other types of items that can be purchased online. So it's a great work. Thank you so much for presenting one. And there is another question. Let me take, uh, uh, asking how does A deal with semantic language problem? Yeah, and Nicole, do you want to take this? Sure, and that's an excellent question, Alex. Um, I think that um, that's something that we'd like to kind of dive into more in future work. As of right now, um, you're right that something like something sarcastic, like I thought this would be a mint green. Um, Aid would uh, grab that review text and take mint green and include it in the alt text, which isn't ideal. But in the future, we'd like to further train the model so that it accounts for such things like that, plus sentiment um, would be something interesting to include in a future iteration of it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Time is up. So let me um, close the session, but please uh, do go for your favorite out of four, which are all great. And we'll have our SP to post our demo videos to our um, system, the Huba. Okay, so thank you so much for the presenters and the audience, and I'll meet you again in our next session. Thank you.